please welcome to the stage Debbie House, editor in chief of Retail Touch Points. Morning, everybody. Um, so, uh, thanks, Alicia, for the introduction. Um, love the video, and thanks all of you for for coming in out of the gorgeous, beautiful weather this morning. I think, with the water and everything, I think we all kind of want to be out there somewhere. Um, so anyway, I applaud all of you for making the intelligent decision to attend this event. It's going to be an amazing day, packed with compelling spe speakers um, and sessions, great networking opportunities, hands-on innovation labs, and quick one-on-one -on -one meetups with industry experts. Um, I speak for the larger we at Retail Touchpoints when I say that we're thrilled to be hosting this event. Since 2007, Retail Touchpoints has been covering the industry and there's my retail touch point slide. Okay, we're going to go back to that for a second. Um, through our weekly digital newsletter that's now read by more than 30,000 executives, our excellent editorial staff travels to industry events, speaking with retail executives, industry analysts, and solution providers on a regular and continuous basis. We're proud of the content we produce and the insights we're able to share. And between all of our staff, I think we've amassed more than 100 years covering and working in the retail industry. Don't quote me on that. We'd have to add it all up amongst ourselves. But uh, we've all been working in this industry for a long time. Um, and also, you know, we didn't put this event together on a whim. Um, we know all of you have a lot of options when it comes to attending retail events. And we wanted to be sure that we were offering relevant, relevant and actionable content that will motivate you to start new conversations when you get back to your offices, in your stores, and throughout all channels. We hope that we've been successful in that quest. So before we kick off the day with our keynote speaker, uh, bear with me for a few minutes while I share some logistical items. So first, um, all the main sessions for the day will happen in this room. You'll also remember during your registration process, you were asked to select innovation lab topics. So those 30-minute hands-on workshops will take place at uh, 4 p.m. and 4.40. And here's the, <laughs> here's the layout of the venue. Um, in rooms 201, 203, 205, and 206. And you will see signs with the topics you've selected outside each door. Um, and you can also ask staff members for assistance. We also have a few other networking opportunities for you during the day at 10.15 and 2.15 during our networking breaks. Um, you'll have a break to, from the sessions to stretch, grab a snack, and connect with your fellow retail executives to network, or of course, check your email, because we know we need to, you, you need to do that as well. Um, but we also have 10-minute um, innovation inspiration sessions um, where you can meet with, uh, with, it's a great opportunity to have a personalized discussion to meet with industry experts. Um, and if you are still interested in those opportunities, um, again, check with our staff to find out if there are any time slots still available for those. We really want this event to be fun and interactive. So we encourage you to share all your takeaways, photos, and feedback through Twitter using the RIC15 hashtag. And you can see a uh, Twitter feed going on to my left throughout the day. Um, and if you're feeling in an especially social mood, um, please contribute to our doodle wall, which is near the main entrance. Since this conference is about collaborating and sharing ideas, we want you to share your unique definition of in innovation on the wall, and then share it on social media as well. Um, free Wi-Fi is available throughout the day, throughout the venue, so you can stay connected. It's the uh, network is Appella, and the password is Appella lowercase. So that's the end of my public service announcements, and I think we're ready to get started now. Um, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I just want to oh, yep, thank our platinum sponsor Epicor for sponsoring this session. Um, so with that. There we go. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome to the stage Ted Rubin, who's author, he's an author and acting CMO of Brand Innovators, one of Forbes' top 50 social media power influencers. Ted's going to share insights into how you can get back into the customer engagement basics and build valuable relationships in a digital world. Um, welcome to Ted. Hey, everybody. So I'm, I'm sharing this on Snapchat. I want to make sure to get out the beginning of this story. Thank you very much. I hope you guys will be a part of it as we head along later on. Really happy to be here. Hope everybody gets comfortable. I'm going to get comfortable. 
roll up my sleeves a little bit. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Ted Rubin. Uh, I've been involved in the digital space since 1997 when I joined a company called Yo-Yo Dine that was founded by a guy named Seth Godin. Most of you guys have probably heard of Seth. I was really fortunate that I got to spend a lot of time with Seth because I moved up, I had relocated to Florida for a while after I closed the business, realized I had to get back to New York, discovered the internet, discovered Seth, was fortunate enough to get a chance to work with him, but I made a classic error when I moved back up to New York. I was married at the time, I had two little girls, and I left them in Florida to finish up the school year and close out the house, and I moved in with my in-laws for a little while. Don't ever, ever move in with your in-laws, okay, under any circumstances. And no matter whether, I don't care if you don't have the money, go into debt, especially if they're like the Costanzas and all they do is yell at each other. Now the good news about that, because everything happens for a reason, is that it got me up early. I'm not an early riser, but I got up at five o'clock every morning so I'd be out of there before anybody woke up in the house. And the good news about that is Seth is an early riser, and he was the only one in this cavernous office in Irvington, New York, and he was basically holding forth on all these new concepts. When I, I was there when he coined the term permission marketing, which has come the base, become the basis for almost everything we do these days in e-commerce, in retail. Um, I was there when he wrote the article for Fast Company, which became his first best-selling book. And although if you guys know me or get to know me a little bit today, I like to talk. Um, I knew that I was in the presence of greatness and I shut up and I listened. And I learned a lot. And a lot of what I talk about, return on relationship, looking people in the eye digitally, this all came from Seth's talking about how to deal with consumers, how to build a relationship, how important permission is. And it was very fortunate for me. Now, I want to warn you, my head is like a Twitter feed. Everybody here on Twitter? You guys watch, you know how Twitter works? You watch the things that goes through? Well, that's the way my mind is. So I tend to go off on tangents, sometimes away from what's up on the screen. You guys got two choices. You can either let me go because you like what I'm saying, or you can pull me back and say, hey, you never finished what you were talking about. And I might have to ask you for a reminder every once in a while. So let's just keep that in mind as we go. Um, we are marketing in an age of digital disruption. You guys all know that. Things are changing dramatically. I was with a buddy of mine recently named Charlie Cole. Some of you might know Charlie. He ran merchandising at Lucky Brands. He was then running Mega Red at Schiff. He's been involved in a lot of changes going on. And I was talking about how I think commerce has come full circle. How it used to be we knew our merchant, they knew us, they knew everything about us, they recommended products, and they only recommended things that were good for us. They knew our family because if not they saw us the next day. Then mass merchandising came along and we all thought we were anonymous. We weren't, but we thought we were. And it was really cool. We could shop without anybody knowing who we were. But everyone knew who we were. We were being targeted. And by the way, please, let's take that word targeting out of our language and replace it with matchmaking. Everybody knows what we're talking about now. Every consumer knows how we're talking about them. Nobody wants to be targeted. Everybody wants a match. So start thinking that way. So I was talking to Charlie, and I was talking about, to me, it's come full circle, because now I believe it's come back to the point where everybody recognizes that you have all their data. They recognize you know exactly who they are, where they are, what they're doing, when they're doing it. And as long as you give them value in return, they want that relationship. They want the relationship to come back. And the way Charlie phrased it was, the future of retail is the past. And I love that. But it's the past with a lot of nuances with a lot of changes. Disruption is everywhere. Why is Uber succeeding? Not because it's necessarily better than other things, because it makes the consumer experience easy. We press a button, a car comes, we get in, it gets paid. We get drivers that actually like what they're doing, talk to us very often, add to our lives. We've got companies that have people on the front line that are building relationships with us for them. I don't like Uber, but I like Uber because I love the drivers. I don't like Airbnb as a company, but I like them vicariously through the people I'm dealing with that re deal with them. Now, I'm going to play a video for you guys, which I don't often like to do. Number one is usually the AV teams don't get it right and they don't work. Last time I ran this, I had to act it out myself. And Brad Pitt's in this email, so I had to be Brad Pitt. You can imagine how that went. But it really makes a point here that I think we have to make, and I want you guys to see it. This is exactly, I, I can't tell you how many meetings I sit in in boardrooms, in ad agencies with this same thing. Ted, why are you telling us this stuff? We have 150 years of combined experience here. We know retail. Everybody here has got to take this to note, start thinking about it, and start thinking how you can change. How did Amazon first succeed? They didn't go head to head with Walmart. Can anybody in this room beat Walmart playing their game? No. 
Why are the Rebecca Minkoffs, the Alex and Annie's, the Zulilis, the Origami Owls succeeding? Because they're changing the model. They're using what's happening today. They're taking all the tools available to them. Well, maybe not all of them. I've got some things I think I could show them how to do a little bit better. But what they're doing is they're recognizing the fact that commerce is changing, that people want to do new things. You need to define the problem. And the problem is we're getting all these amazing tools and we're not using them to build relationships. Facebook has done a remarkable thing. They've taken ownership of the word friend. They've stolen it from us. They've devalued the word friend and made it into something that means the click of a button. Now, I admire them. I am not putting them down. Facebook did a remarkable thing. Close your eyes, think of the word friend, and see what comes up in your head. It's not a friend. It's a Facebook logo. And that's scary. I first noticed I'm a divorced dad. I have two teenage daughters, 18 and 20 now, so I don't see them too often. But I used to see them all the time. And I walk into, I first notice I walk in their room, and I'm walking by the room. They're never leaving their room. This voice is coming out of it. There's nobody there but them. They're on four different screens. And I walk in, I go, don't you guys have friends? They go, yeah, Dad, look, I got 500 friends. I'm like, really? Who's that? I don't know. Who's that? I don't know. And it scared me. And it didn't scare me for my daughters. I have no worry at all about the security of online and who they're meeting and what they're doing. My fear was that everyone in this room is doing the exact same thing. Social has made marketing hard and the tools are making it look too easy. You guys think you can click a button and make a friend. You think you can put on an Instagram post and hey, we're doing social. We've got an Instagram page. People are commenting on it. You're not commenting back. For some reason, and this is typical of that video and what goes on in corporate America, is you've all decided that the place to communicate with customers is Twitter. So if you're doing anything at all, you're doing it there. You're using it for customer service. You're answering people's questions. Go to the people who are the best on Twitter, make a comment on their Facebook page, and see if you can get an answer. Almost impossible. Harry's, the shaving company, I've, I've commented 50 times asking them about their product. Tell them I want to buy it, but I hate Dollar Shave Club. Sorry if you guys are here in the audience. Um, I, I don't hate the company. I just hate the product. Is yours any better? I can't get a reply. I am a customer walking in your door, asking somebody behind the counter about the product, and she's turning her back on me and not answering my question. You know what doesn't work for a social media strategy, people? Not being social. I'm going to say it again. You know what doesn't work for a social media strategy? Not being social. Going on social platforms is advertising. Putting up posts there is advertising. You're not using these platforms in the way that they can best be leveraged. And you want to know why? Because it's hard work. It's really hard. I was talking to Gary Vee the other day, Gary Vaynerchuk. He spoke at a conference. I introduced him. And he's telling people that, he goes, you guys think I like this stuff? Now, you know Gary. He said, I hate this fucking stuff. He goes, I built my business using email marketing, using targeted banners, using direct marketing. He goes, but I can't do that anymore. Now I've got to communicate. I've got to be on 24-7. I've got to start getting my employees to do it with me, or I'm going to lose, just like everybody else is going to lose. We need to start looking people in the eye digitally. It's really that simple. If I walk up and we meet each other and we shake hands, are we friends now? No, you've just given me a door opener to begin a friendship. That's what the click of a button is. That's what a like, that's what a follow on Twitter is. That's what, wherever it happens to be, that's a door opener. And you guys have to start recognizing that that's the beginning, it's not the end. And I would say, invariably, everybody in this room, and I'm sure there are some exceptions, that's the way they're viewing it. So I'm going to tell you guys the best social media book ever written, the one every one of you guys has to buy. And if I ask you guys to guess, no one in this room will guess it, because it's not written by any of the social media pundits that you know or that you think of. It's certainly not written by me. I'll give you a clue. It was written in 1936. And it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I have a copy on my phone. I have a copy on my iPad. I have a copy on my, on my coffee table. And I read it every week 
to remind me about how to look people in the eye digitally. That's what my book is. My book is just, it's simple. It's really not revolutionary. It's common sense. You guys are probably all saying that right now. This, is, this guy isn't really telling us anything that's new. But the truth is, common sense is not very common. And you need to start learning how to engage people. We are super connected, yet we're totally disconnected. We can reach everybody, but we're not reaching them. We're still sending them marketing messages via text. We're still trying to send them marketing messages via Twitter. We're not engaging and talking to people. Now, here's a problem. You're saying, OK, well, we're a big company. We've got thousands of people, thousands of customers, tens of thousands of customers. We've got a million fans on Facebook. How can we communicate with all of them? You don't have to. The vast majority of people that follow you on social platforms have absolutely no interest in speaking directly to you. But what they do have an interest in is how you communicate and how you engage with the people that do want to communicate with you. Don't listen to your agencies that tell you you got to get more comments on your page. You got to pay us to put out really better, better engaging content and get many more people engaging. No, you've got to concentrate on the people that are already engaging with you and have conversations with them. Because everybody else will do what I call participate vicariously. They watch those conversations, and they feel a part of them. Think about being at a cocktail party. Big room, a couple, few hundred people. There's usually pockets, right, with conversations going on. There's one person holding forth. There's about 10 or 15 people surrounding him. Maybe one or two people are engaging and talking to him. Everybody walks away from that conversation feeling connected to that person that was talking, because they participated vicariously. This is happening at scale online. And I witnessed this person. I've been talking about this for years. I left a company that I was with that was a startup in August of 2013. And I had been with a series of companies. I was with Collective Bias. I was with Open Sky before that, Elf Cosmetics before that. All of a sudden, I was independent. And people started engaging with me differently. And I'm bumping into people all over the country, people that are not friends of mine on Facebook, that I had no idea were following everything, because I leave it open, by the way. I'm a big believer is there is no line between business and personal anymore. People want to know who you are as a person. They want to engage with you. They want to know what you're doing with your kids. They want to know what you're doing on the weekends. And I can't tell you how many CEOs and CMOs have approached me every single day talking to me about things that I've done over the last two years. They know everything I've done because they've been following me without showing themselves. That's the way 95% of consumers are doing it. I can't tell you how many CEOs have walked up to me and said, dude, that surfing trip with your 16-year-old, we got to talk about that. Or, wow, that trip you took to Australia. And what I've learned is that engaging with people on personal things opens up the door to business, because that's how people think. So I like funky socks, OK? There's a story behind these, as there are behind a lot of the socks I have. I started wearing them. People started noticing them. I've become known for them now. For four and a half years now, I've been posting them on Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest. I have a Pinterest page. I have a, a Tumblr, We Heart Socks. And what it's taught me, something that I always knew, but that I pass along to companies, is it's about building your personal brand and your personal brand as a company as well, about things that people find easy to talk about, not necessarily your business. I'm not in the business of socks, but people go to the internet every day and communicate with me over what I'm wearing and what I'm doing. And it's an easy way for them to reach out. They don't have to say, say something intelligent about some marketing tweet I sent. They can say, what socks are you wearing today? I have CEOs walk up to me in the lobbies of buildings and stick out their foot like this to take a picture. When I go to hotels, they leave them for me. And the point I'm making is not necessarily about this. It's about how you connect and engage on an emotional level. You see that? When you're not present in the conversation, there's no true connection. Everybody know what this is? What is this? iPhone, right? What's the biggest word in iPhone? Don't say I. It's not about you. Biggest word is phone. Everybody have one of these? You all have apps on your phones? There's a remarkable app that comes pre-installed on every one of these phones that most of you guys don't even know exists. It's got 10 numbers, 0 to 9. And if you press 7 to 10 of them, you can actually hear somebody's voice. It's freaking remarkable. You don't have to use emoticons to express emotion. You can yell. You can cry, you can whisper, 
You can laugh and people actually build a connection. Now, I'm going to challenge you guys to do something because you guys aren't using this enough anymore because you're afraid of two things. You think it doesn't scale and you think it's going to waste too much of your day. So I'm going to challenge you every day for the next 30 days to pick up this phone and call somebody you haven't spoken to in a while and just say hello. Give your mom a break and say hello to her and make it as simple as this. Get on the phone and say, what can I do for you today? And most of the people will say, hey, so nice of you to call. I got to run. And you say, great. And now you're going to say to me again, it doesn't scale, but it does. Because people talk about it. They say, I can get on the phone. When your phone rings for once, pick it up, people. I bet you I can call everybody in this room and I get voicemail from every single one, no matter when it is in the day. Make it a habit to pick up your phone. Don't be afraid to say, hey, I can't talk right now. My number is 516-270-5511. Call me anytime. I give out my number on stage all the time, and you know what? Nobody calls. But it's awesome, because everybody tweets out. Ted Rubin just gave, us, gave out his phone number. Invariably, somebody calls it while I'm on stage. Please don't. Just because they think maybe I'm giving out the wrong number. You know, this isn't TV where everything's 555. It's about connecting. It's about building a reputation. I'm going to jump ahead now on one of my slides that comes up later, and I'll tell you that a brand is what you or your business does. A reputation is what people remember and share. Online relationships require the same personal attention as face-to-face -face ones. You need to start looking at people. You need to start understanding what they're about. You need to start caring about who they are. And again, I promise you, this scales. I've done it. I've done it for brands. We'll get into it in a little while. And I tell you that people feel that personal connection. Customers don't trust brands. And truth be told, customers don't want more products. Who in this room really wants another thing to buy or another thing to do? And that's another good point. Stop thinking like marketers and start thinking like customers. Because again, I sit in these rooms all the time, and there's two things I hear. I hear guys thinking about how to sell something instead of how to buy something. And you guys are all consumers. And then I hear the 45-year-old guy who tells me he wouldn't buy something or wouldn't buy it the way I'm trying to sell it, and I'm trying to sell it to a 28-year-old woman. And I laugh and say, well, that's great, because I don't want you to buy it. So I don't care if you wouldn't buy that. Why aren't you asking the people who will buy it? Why aren't you paying attention to what they're talking about? Customers do trust people. And that's why you have to put a face to your company. And that face, by the way, is your employees. And customers do seek new experiences. There's a reason that stores like Rebecca Minkoff's, like why Alex and Annie are succeeding, why these new methods are beating others without, not, without a small percentage of the budget they have. Old marketing was dictation. New marketing is communication. We've got to change from convince and convert to converse and convert. I believe conversation is the best content. You guys are all producing content, and that's great, and you need to. And you need to create value. You need to give a reason for these people to come to you other than just buying. But it's the conversation that you're creating. Why don't more companies look at customer service as the best marketing they have? Why does customer service report very often to the CFO rather than the CMO? I don't get it. How could that possibly work as a CMO? The first relationships I build when I join a company are the CTO, and the head of customer service. And the CTO is easy. I buy him an expensive bottle of liquor, and he's my buddy. But the customer service person is being rewarded completely differently than I am. And there is a disconnect. So I have two daughters. And I've learned that it's about moments of connection. It's about when can you get them talking. So the best time for me to talk to my daughters now, especially that they're 18 and 20, is when they want money. Right? Because they put their hand out, and they know that if they turn their back, Nothing's hitting the hand. They're paying attention to every single word that's coming out of my mouth. Because they're waiting for me to say yes. So now I have a marketing opportunity. Now I don't leverage that by saying do this or otherwise I won't give you this. I leverage it in a different way. I now have my marketing opportunity. Don't drink and drive. 
please don't get in the car with somebody. Call me anytime. I say things that make sense. I'm preaching a little bit, but again, I'm not making them do something, but they're paying attention. Customer service is the exact same moment. You have 100% attention of your customer. They've got a problem. They're listening to you. Now is the time to build a relationship. I was in the hotel last night at the Roger. I checked in. They put me in a lousy room. Nobody had bothered checking. It was about 78 degrees. The air conditioning wasn't working. It was... It, 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 uh, <laughs> there you go. How, did it have that loud noise coming out of the ceiling? I'm a, I have to do a conference call. I'm late. I'm dripping. I call down to the front desk and I say, <laughs> and I say, I got to get out of here. You know, and probably, and by the way, part of my brand is just be nice. I usually wear a shirt that says be good to people, but there's times where that just doesn't work, right? But again, I'm trying to be nice, but I'm a little stressed and I go, I need another room. Now, they did the right thing, and here's where a lot of the disconnect comes. They were trained to say, great, Mr. Rubin, we'll change your room, but they were angry. Okay, I come downstairs. I don't even get the word out of my mouth. They go, yeah, we know. Here, go, goodbye. Here's your new room. They don't smile. They don't say we're sorry. I said, well, listen, you really don't want to, we know, we know, don't put anybody else in the room because I'm thinking about the next guy that's going to get in the room. So if you're going to do it, do it and build a relationship. Thank me for giving you the input and telling you what's going on. Don't get annoyed with what I'm saying. I can give you a dozen more stories like this. Because for me, the two best places to be remarkable in this world right now are hospitality and retail. You guys know everything about your customers. They're standing there right in front of you, and you're dropping the ball. Now, to give a little credit to the Roger, I'm upstairs in their restaurant later in that evening. I'm talking about my experience with another person that I had met that's a business person that's a friend of mine. We were talking about social and interaction and a little bit about today. And the waiter overheard me. And to his credit, he immediately called down to management and he comes over and buys me cocktails and says, you know what, I'm sorry, I was listening a little bit to your conversation, but that's kind of what we do here. He goes, I heard you had a problem and it wasn't handled properly, we want to try to make it better. Bang! They're right back in the ballpark. It's that easy. So we did that already, right? We can skip right by that, but I'll say it again. A brand is what you do. A reputation is what people remember and share. Don't forget that your brand is not what you make up in your boardrooms. It's not what you talk around with your branding company. It's how people talk about you. If you only focus on the money, you risk overlooking the people. It's really simple, everybody. It's really simple. Just be nice. Anybody here ever see Roadhouse? Patrick Swayze? He's given the speech to the bouncers. Just be nice. I won't repeat what some of their comments were, but he kept saying, just be nice until it's time to not be nice. And then you do what you have to do. JetBlue will not be bullied. JetBlue will talk to you. They'll do anything they can to fix a problem, but they have a policy about bullying. If you threaten them, about your social following or what you're going to share, basically the conversation ends. But they've also made that public. They don't just do it. They want you to know why they're ending the conversation. You got to get to know your customers and prospects. If you don't, you're wasting your marketing dollars. It's all out there for you people. LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Go to their pages. Anybody know what this is? the proverbial fly on the wall, right? Everybody wants to be a fly, and we've always said that. Love to be a fly on a wall of that meeting. Most consumers are inviting you into their living rooms, and you're not going. You're sitting in your rooms worrying about who's commenting on your Facebook page. You're worried about Facebook algorithms. And by the way, guys, forget about that. It's crap. Organic reach still exists. It exists if you provide content that makes people want to see your page. It exists if you go visit their pages. Here's a stat for you. You know, you've heard that number, 4% of people see your organic content. By the way, when 100% of the people saw it, they were ignoring it all because it was like banner ads, and they knew it was. 100% of the people that go to your Facebook page see your Facebook page. Which means if people are going there because they say, I wonder what Alex and Annie has on their Facebook page today. I want to see it. Not waiting for it to show up in their feed. And I, I guarantee you, the companies that are doing it right, that is happening for them. Amazon is testing out now doing special programs on a Facebook page. 
because they know the world is there. It's an easy place for people to get to. They're opening up in the morning and going there first. And don't believe the pundits that are telling you people aren't going to Facebook anymore. It's crap. And don't believe them when they tell you millennials aren't going to Facebook anymore. It's crap. They're just using it differently. If you ask a millennial in front of his friends if he uses Facebook, he will tell you no. Listen to their conversations, go to their pages, see what they're talking about. Look, this is no different than men claiming today. You ever see the studies now? Men are doing much more around the house. Men are doing all the shopping for women. Ask the same freaking guys with their wife sitting next to them, and those stats will change dramatically, or they're going to get smacked on the back of the head. Because admit it, ladies, 90% of your husbands that are doing shopping, how are they going to the store? With the list you made for them. And if they buy anything that's not on that list, what happens to them? They get smacked. Okay? Women control 85% of the purchases in this country. That's the stat you guys all hear, right? I beg to differ. I think it's a lot higher because I think the other 15% are men buying shit to please women, to impress women, to not make women angry. So mark my words, write this down. Social media ceases to exist without women. Men do not communicate that way. We don't. We don't talk to each other. We talk at each other. We don't care what the other guy's saying. We're just waiting for him to finish so we can say what we want to say. Right, ladies? We're looking over your shoulder, nodding our head at the ESPN scores. If one time we get up and take out the garbage when you asked us to, we could solve probably the world's crisis. But we're not ready to do that personally, but we need to do it with our relationships in business. Otherwise, we're missing the boat. Boomers were the original millennials. Any boomers in this room? Right? Boomers started all of this stuff. Boomers were the first to march on Washington, to demand civil rights for a group other than their own, to care about the environment. All this stuff started. Millennials are no different. Stop being so scared of millennials. They're just people. They just have different tools. This is like the genetics environment question. It's not genetics, people. They're not different. It's environment. They've grown up with immediate answers. They've grown up with access to Google. Thank God for Google. I wouldn't have been able to answer 90% of my daughter's questions when they were little and they were studying the clouds or anything else. But this has become second nature. And here's the difference. When boomers started maturing the same way millennials will, and they had responsibilities, and they started needing things like insurance and homes and taking care of their families and steady jobs, Boomers had to stop doing what they were doing before because there were no tools that allowed them to march on Washington while they were making a living. Now those tools exist. So what's happening is that same mindset is not leaving us when we move into a different world. It's going along with us. So think about it that way. They still need homes. You know, people, I, here's what line I hear. Well, boomers are the first generation that don't care about cars. I mean, uh, millennials are the first generation that don't care about cars. Yes, they do. They just don't have to. We had no choice. We needed a car. That nobody, you don't need a car anymore. Cars to go, Lyft, Uber. I mean, I'm talking in generalities here. I'm not talking specifics, and there's some communities you might need it. But understand that. Think about when you're a boomer and you're sitting in a, in a room trying to think about how millennials think. Think about how you thought. Number one, when you were younger, because we tend to forget. But number two, when you had the time and the passion available to do the things that you love to do. Now, here's a company that gets it. Anybody here fly JetBlue? Okay, you guys remember back in 2007 and 2009 when they were having flights stuck on the runways all over the country? It was a really bad problem. There was a major problem going on with their operations and logistics. Excuse me one second. Now, of course they had to fix the problem because you guys all know that marketing is not going to get you out of anything if you've got a crappy product. But they, fixed, they were fixing their problem they were fixing the logistics, but then they had a major marketing meeting. How do we fix this? Do we advertise our way out of it? And they made a critical decision that they were going to start using social media in the early days to start engaging and communicating because they had a realization that it's about people getting to talk to people. Airlines are not going to solve your problems. Flight's not taking off because you're complaining. Not finding your bags when it wasn't. So here I am. I'm on a flight in 2009. At the end of this whole crisis, it's almost over, but I'm on one of the last flights that gets stuck on a runway for over two hours, and it's going to South by Southwest. Everybody know what South by Southwest is? Biggest digital event in the world. 50,000 people expected. We're sitting on the runway for two and a half hours. 
with no answers. So finally, I get frustrated, like a good social media guy, I whip out my laptop, throw in my hotspot, and I tweet out to Edgeup Blue the way I do to most brands, saying, hey guys, love you guys, but what's going on today? Within five minutes, I had a response that said, typical boilerplate, which is okay. Starts out with, sorry you're having a problem, doing everything we can to solve it, we'll hopefully have you in the air soon. End. I said, well, that's not good enough. That's what the flight attendants are telling me. I want to hear more. And little by little, I start getting information. They start telling me that our bags are on the New Orleans flight, and the New Orleans bags are on the Austin flight. And then they decide to get a little cute with me, which I kind of enjoyed. And they said, so, still want us to take off? You can do that. You can do that as long as you're paying attention. If you do that and then walk away and go do another job, and the person blows it up, then you're screwed. But if you pay attention to see how that person reacts, the same way you would with your friend on the phone when you make a joke and you listen to make sure they got it so that you can fix it if they didn't. So I kind of thought that was funny. But I said, so what's the big deal? Now here's where it comes in, just like your business. The consumer never understands the logistics of your business and how hard it is. They never get it. I'm just a guy on a plane. All I, all I care about is getting taken off. So I said, what's the big deal? Take the bags off one plane, bring them over here. Take them off the other plane, bring them over here. I volunteered to get off the plane and help them. I told them I'd get them 10 more able-bodied guys on the plane to help them move the bags. Now, they could have just said, we don't do that. But instead, they came back and they started explaining to me the logistics of the airline business. We can't unload bags on the tarmac. We don't have a gate. We need a crew and there's none available. And during this conversation that we're having back and forth, that everybody's seeing, because they didn't take me to direct message, they didn't ask me to go to email, they had a conversation with me publicly because JetBlue understands if one person's complaining, there's a good bet there's 150 people with the same exact problem. And that by communicating with me, they are scaling the reaction, answer, and connection. So a few minutes in, they said to me, guess what? We got a gate, we got a crew, we'll have you in the air in 30 minutes. That's all we want, right? We want engagement. We want to know what the end to this is. We want to know an end game. So I said, great. And they thought they were done. They said, have a nice flight. I said, wait a second. We're all going to get in after midnight to South by Southwest, and it's about the parties. It's not about the business. So how about free drinks for everybody on the plane? And they came back with the boilerplate answer, FAA regulations say. And my answer was, blah, 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 we want a party. And instead of just blowing me off, we had a little back and forth, and they come back and they go, how about free movies for everybody after you take off? I was not looking to start trouble. I was just having a little fun. And I said, great. Now, they did a few things. They made me famous on the plane. I was giving information. The flight attendants were coming to me to ask what was going on. Everybody was patting me on the back. So they got out the information. They made me feel great. They solved and took down a big notch. All the people, no, nobody on the plane was complaining anymore because they all had answers. We took off. JetBlue didn't have Wi-Fi back in 2009. They barely still have it now. So we won't go there because it's one of the reasons I don't fly them a lot, even though I love them. But I landed like a good social media guy. I whipped out my phone and I tweeted out, kudos to at JetBlue. They couldn't solve my problem, but they engaged me. 60 days later, I'm on a panel at the CMO Club Summit with a room full of CMOs from Fortune 500 down to small startups. I'm on a panel with Morgan Johnson, head of communications for JetBlue, who I didn't know and never met. Jamie Punishell, who was then running um, social for Citibank before uh, Frank Eliasson was there. And Jeff Roars from Exact Target was moderating the concept. I was at Elf Cosmetics, selling cosmetics to women, which is nothing but fun. Right, ladies? You guys all love cosmetics. You all become little girls. When you get a cosmetics, you take pictures. And I mean, what a better place to learn about social. And I'm selling an aspirational brand, and these guys are getting nothing but complaints. So that was the nature of this panel. And all of a sudden, Morgan's talking about how they try to respond to every single person that reaches out to him on social. And I looked over at him, and I'd never met him, and I didn't introduce myself when I got there. And I said, i got to give you kudos. And he froze. He started pointing at me. He said, oh my god, you're the guy. And he looks up, he says, at Ted Rubin, you're the drinks guy. And I looked at him just incredulously, and I said, how do you know? He said, because that was me tweeting with you. Because back in 2009, JetBlue already had an escalation policy for somebody asking questions that the person on social couldn't answer to get to somebody that could answer the questions. Today, they've got a 38 to 45 person staff, and they've got a hotline to somebody in every division of the company, operations, flight control, flight attendants, to answer questions that they can't answer, and they must get back to them when this, within five minutes. And if you tweet at JetBlue, I guarantee you they will tweet you back. They had a major crisis in 2000, two years later, after this was all over. You guys remember when that plane got stuck in Hartford? At Bradford International Airport for nine and a half hours on the runway, it got so bad that the pilots went off channel, 
complaining, saying they were out of, they were out of food, they were out of place to go to the bathroom. There was a hush. FAA put, um, I'm sorry, the DOT put a hush order on it. JetBlue cannot answer one tweet, one question. To this day, no one really knows what happened there. And guess what? You want to talk about the ROI of social? It's called social insurance. Nobody complained because the tweets going out were saying, if JetBlue's not answering, there must be a reason they always answer. It's your reputation. Dwayne Reed lives it. Here's a retailer. Full disclosure, I helped them build their social following and, and most of their content back in 2011. They had 500 Twitter followers when we started. See that number? It's over 2 million. They have more Twitter followers than Target and Walmart combined. They're a local regional chain with 256 stores and Twitter's done two case studies on them because they get four times the interaction and engagement of anybody else that they work with on their sponsored tweets. Why? Because the majority of their tweets are interacting and engaging with their consumers. It's not selling health and beauty aids. It's not talking about pharmaceuticals. The most active conversation they had when we built their social presence was about the New York skyline. It was about events happening in New York City because people all around the country wanted to hear about this. They were owned by Walgreens, who has 8,000 stores, and they had 10 times the amount of interaction and engagement on their channels. Because they talked about things that people were interested in. How'd they do that? They threw out a lot of different things. We started throwing out pictures, we started doing things, and we saw what people react to. I do it all the time. Follow me on Twitter. See things I put out. When you see me put out something that people latch onto, I jump into it. Why? Because people are interested. FedEx, not so much. Anybody here have a deal with FedEx or try to reach them on social channels? Apparently they have to get five levels of approval to send out a tweet, unless they have an agency doing it. So here's what you don't do. And I put this in here because it's really important because all you guys are sitting in rooms, you're coming up with ideas for campaigns. I'm a big adversary of campaigns. Campaigns are very limited. I know they're important, but what you guys have to open your eyes up to is if something's working, extend it. Or if you do a campaign, make sure people are prepared for what happens. Everybody wants something to go viral, but you guys aren't ready when it does. So FedEx, somebody gave him this great idea, by the way. Now again, divorced dad, don't get a lot of time with my daughter, could, did not get to take my daughters to any colleges to visit. My 16-year-old says she wants to go to Duke. We have, I have the February vacation coming up, and guess what? There's a basketball game. Duke-Syracuse. You guys remember that last year? It was the biggest game of the season. So I knew this was a great way to get it done. I tell her I'm going to take her. I get the tickets. Mom says, why are you going with Dad? You should be going with me. She says, do you have Duke-Syracuse tickets? Mom says, no. End of conversation. So I am all over it. I'm tweeting about it. I'm posting about it. I'm away with my daughter. I'm in dad heaven. And FedEx notices it because they're doing a campaign about reaching out to influencers and engaging with them in real conversation. And then surprising them and delighting them. So they jump into my conversation. They start talking to me about Duke. As you can see, I wrote this, this tweet, Duke, Duke, Duke. Um, they jumped in. And then, at some point, after they developed a relationship, and they did this very well, whatever agency handled it for them, great job. They asked me for my address. I give it to them. A week later, I get a box with all Duke paraphernalia, t-shirts, hats, blankets. I mean, really cool, great job. I'm excited, I'm loving FedEx. Before, I really couldn't have cared less. So what do I do? Guess what, they reached out, you're reaching out to influencers, to social media people. What do you think those people do? They go to social media. So I go out and I start, Thanking them. One time, two times, three times, 12 times, nothing. The campaign was over. The agency wasn't getting paid anymore. Agencies don't do anything unless they're getting paid. People in FedEx were not authorized to tweet. Absolute dead air canaries. They took a guy who couldn't have cared about USPS, UPS, FedEx, got him up here, and then made me a FedEx hater. And not only will I never use FedEx if I have a choice, but I talk about this on stage around the world. And this slide has been in my presentation now for almost two years. And they're still doing it. And I finally met someone from FedEx who explained to me, we have to get five approvals. They're a shipping company, for God's sake. They need five approvals to say, thank you. Think about that, people. This is how easy it is to train your people. My daughter wanted Adobe Photoshop. Here was your customer service moment. My, old, my older daughter was 15. She sends me a text, of course, because that's the way she communicates. And there's another lesson for you. Stop trying to drag people to the channels that you like to communicate on and stay in the channels that they like communicating on. If I want to make phone calls, I will never, ever speak to my daughters. I've even moved now from text to Snapchat because I know that I can barely get her attention on text anymore. But my daughter calls me up and she says she wants Adobe Photoshop. Now that's a 
conversation moment. It doesn't cost a, a nickel. So I said, great, tell me why. You have to get on the phone. And she does, because now there's a reason to. She explains how she wants to be an artist. She's in her third year of fine arts school now at Skidmore. And how she's taking a lot of photos, and she wants to use it. I said, great. She goes, but dad, and here comes the divorced dad side of it. Um, Mom says you're going to try to buy a pirated version to save money. Um, I want the real Adobe Photoshop. <laughs> so I'm used to this. I said, great, come on over. We'll do it together. She goes, but it's not your night. I go, but how else can I help you with this? She comes over. We're on there. Would anybody here ever try to download Adobe Photoshop? Next to impossible. Okay, amazing product once you get it, but next to impossible to download. So I'm sitting there with my daughter. She's stressing out. The text is going off every two minutes from her mom. It's not dad's night. When are you coming home? And finally, I get frustrated, and I go to the 800 number, and I get the recording saying it's after 6 o'clock. You know, call back tomorrow. So I go to Twitter, and I don't complain. I don't even tag Adobe. I'm hoping for one of you guys to help me. I got a lot of friends who are technolo technologically sound. I tweet out, can anybody help me download a fo Adobe Photoshop having a real problem? Within five minutes, I got 10 replies from Adobe employees around the globe in all different works of life. And these people were trained. Guys, none of you guys, I don't know if you guys can afford this training. Every tweet was the same and said, how can I help you? Miraculous. How can I help you? You guys got to get a lot of legal approval for those kind of questions. Now, they did have really strong software in place. So they noticed that there were multiple people talking to me and it very quickly fed down to one who said, when, how long do you have? When will you have the computer back? And they took it offline and they set it up for me. By the way, it took an hour and a half to get that software on my daughter's computer. But I did it. But the point is, it doesn't take a lot of training to do this and to make it right. And to train your employees to do something as simple as click a like button. You know how much consumers love when you like their stuff? Do you know how much they love when you just thank them for a comment? How much does it take? What kind of training does it take to say, thank you? Go to Facebook. See if it's happening. It's not. You guys want to stand out? You want to be remarkable? Be the one that starts doing it tomorrow. You don't even have to tell anybody that I told you to do it. You got to start amplifying the customer experience. Start addressing them by name. Read Dale Carnegie. Nobody, everybody, the most pleasant word in any language for any person is the sound of their own name. Follow me on any social channel. You'll see I reply to people by name. I go to the effort of finding it. If it's not in their handle, I go to their bio. If it's not in their bio, I click a link on it. I do everything I can. And if they don't have that, sometimes I'll take the initials of what they're using. Stay at home mom. I'll call her TSM. Just to show I'm paying attention. It's not that hard. Find something in their bio and mention it. There's so much information there. Stop paying attention to these things. Go to their pages. See what they're talking about. Everybody likes to know you're paying attention. And by the way, if they liked your page, then they showed interest and it's not creepy. And by the way, guys, please stop the retargeting. Or start looking at it the right way. All you guys are probably retargeting your retailers, your e-tailers, right? The, re the, the, e the, the retargeters come into you and they sell you the exact way I would sell you. I was a salesman. I trained salesmen. They say to you, hey, we'll give it to you for free. Check the lift. This is what we'll charge you. You do it. You see a 5% lift. It costs you 2%. You say, hey, there's extra money. But you're not looking at the other side, the people that you're pissing off. The people who are walking out of that store saying, why are you trying to sell me that now? Why are you offering me a discount after I left? You've got to take that information and use it when it's appropriate. So one last daughter story, if you guys will go with me. My daughter's 15. I'm out to dinner with her by herself. They're usually together. You know what the kids are like when they're together. She's finally talking to me. Out of nowhere, she starts talking about boys. And I just shut my mouth. Because again, I'm evolved enough as a dad and a man to know this is a time to listen. This is a moment. And she tells me that they call them by code names, red, blue, orange, green, so that they can talk about the boys without them know they're talking about them. And I am sitting there, God is shining down on me, I'm in heaven, until the waitress walks over, throws down the check, and the moment ends. My daughter goes right to her device. She starts FaceTiming and talking and snapping. And we get in the car and she's on the phone with a friend. And we get home and I am desperate to get back in just like you guys are. I want to sell her more shit. The moment was there, I had her. So we get to the house, she walks off to the side of the driveway to finish her conversation. I wait for her, ladies, I swear it was dark. I was caring for her. I was not listening. She comes walking back over and then when she's done and what do I do? I say, so were you talking about blue? Don't cover your eyes because you know what happened. She looked at me like I was from another freaking planet. 
How dare me even bring that up? We never had that conversation. The same way your consumers are looking at you when you try to upsell them something they don't want. When you're just trying to add to the cart and you're not adding value. So I learned really quick. I took that notice. I never did it again. I stuck that information into my database. The same one all you guys have with all that information that you're never pulling up at the right times because you're not giving your people the tools to do it. And every one, there's not a person in retail that shouldn't have those tools in front of them. Six months later, I'm in Estapa, Mexico, with my two daughters at a club med. They're absolutely paying no attention to me whatsoever. I'm barely getting meals with them. And finally, my older daughter gets pissed off, tells my younger one to leave her alone. She doesn't want to go in the water with her. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I'm laying on a hammock. I hear, Dad, will you go in the water with me? Now, inside, I was jumping up and down. <laughs> right? It's the same way you guys as a retail. Like, I got them. In, but I had to kind of be cool. I said, yeah, sure. I kind of casually get up. I walk over to the water. We get in, and all of a sudden, she starts talking about her friend, Lori, and they were talking about orange. And I dug into my database, and I pulled out the information, and I was able to give an answer that made sense that showed her two things. Number one is I was interested in paying attention to her. And number two is that I cared enough to save that information for the right moment. And I said, really? What did Blue think? And she, like, a smile came across her face, and the conversation flourished. This is the way you guys got to start thinking about it. Show them you're listening to what they're saying. Repeat things back to them. Bring up the information when it's important to them. Make it personal and authentic. Go to their pages. Have that information ready for all of the people working for you. You guys heard Kelly LeBay speak yesterday if you were at the luncheon at the awards. She's a one-person team. I think she has one other person working for her for a company that's doing $300 million in business with 65,000 direct sellers around the country. And she is responding and communicating and building relationships that are scaling without a tool. She doesn't even have a software tool. I'm not advocating that, but I'm saying it can be done. Every one of you guys can be doing it. Find them on all possible channels. Don't try to bring them to your channels. Go to theirs. Send a note or a helpful link or a photo just because. Do it out of nowhere. You don't have to do it to all of them. Do it to 10. They will tell everybody. And take it offline. Pick up the phone and call them. Find something in their bio and make a mention of it. So look at this bio. Here's Mike Davidson. VP of design at Twitter, harsh critic of coconut water eggs, people put clothes on their pets. I mean, if this guy wrote me a tweet, my response to him would be, raincoats on dogs, seriously? I wouldn't even make a mention that he had it in his thing, but he would know what I was talking about. When someone tweets me from Park City, I tweet back or share something of mine. I say, thanks for sharing. I love to ski. They know what I'm talking about. They know that I'm looking at them. You guys ever get trained on how to go on that first date, that first meeting, or anything like that by your dad or your mom? What do they tell you? Look at the person. Son, if you want that woman to pay any attention to you or that girl, you better be looking at her and not everybody else walking in the room. My dad calls me up at my first job. He heard I had an appointment. He goes, so when are you, what are you doing? I said, I'm going Friday at 10 o'clock. He goes, what time are you getting there? I said, I don't know, 10 to 10. He goes, no, you're getting there at 9 o'clock. I didn't have all the tools we have today. He said, you're going to walk around the neighborhood, see what stores are there, what restaurants are there, go in the building, see what other companies are there. Get his secretary, if possible, her secretary, to get you into his office early. And I do say secretary because this was 1980. That's what they were called. And look around the room. Look at pictures. Look at photos. Look at diplomas. See what it's about. Find that point of emotional connection. Guys, you have this stuff all over the place, and you're not using it. It's all there. Make your employees. The need for recognition goes beyond just names. Assign employees in your company every day to go to the pages and the feeds of the social profiles of your customers. And come back and talk about it. Engage, captivate, and make every experience remarkable. Do the best you can do that. Like I said earlier, the hospitality industry has the most opportunities and they drop the ball every day. And what about retail? Why don't more stores copy what Nordstrom's does? Why don't more people come out from behind the counter? Why can't more associates be allowed to walk somebody to another department instead of pointing to it? You're afraid of saying that you're copying somebody else? Why would you be afraid? I copy everybody that does good shit. I pick up things from other speakers. I pick up things from other social media people. I learn every day and I incorporate it into what I do. Awareness equals revenues. The more you're out there, the more you talk, the more possibility you have of making sales. Differentiators equal margins. Be the one that answers on Facebook. Be the one that communicates people and saves those moments and uses them at the right time, and your margins will increase because everybody's willing to pay for more value. Everybody. 
I don't care how cheap you are, there are people that go to those stores where they walk in and another register opens up the minute there's one person waiting online. I am the classic guy. I hate specialty supermarkets. Why would I want to pay more than going to a Wallbounds? But I go to the one near me every day because of the way they make me feel. They welcome me when I walk in. They take responsibility. They have people in the aisles. I mean, Home Depot's learning that lesson, right? What happened to them when you couldn't find anybody in the store anymore? Authenticity equals loyalty and advocacy, and all immeasurable and all equal increased sales. And start empowering your employees, people. Empower your employees and they will power your brand. Start letting them speak. Take off the muzzles. Start getting them to share. Get them to share content. Do for them without expectation or anything in return. Make them better when they leave you than when they join you. Stop worrying about educating them because then they might leave. Have you guys ever seen that slide that says CFO says to CEO, what if we train them and they leave? And the CEO says, what if we don't and they stay? Right? Start doing for them. You want them to share your content? Help them build their social influence. You want to use a, 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 a platform? I'm on the advisory board of a company called Dynamic Signal. Unbelievable company. It use, has compliance built in, content, everything to help your employees share content. But I, they brought me in because I'm the one out there telling their clients, don't just share content about yourself. Share content that's actually relevant to your employees about travel, about education, about things that they might actually want to share other than just about your company. Help them grow their influence. Bring in people that teach them how to use social. And forget about blocking social channels, guys. That's a joke. It's never going to happen. You want to know why there's more smoking breaks in this country now than there were three years ago? Check the stats. You think more people are smoking? No, they're taking iPhone breaks. They're going outside to get on. They should be online at their desk using these social channels, integrating it into what they do. You want them to do it better? Train them. A brand will come critically valuable to an employee or a consumer if they invest their own time in it. Think membership. You guys remember how the old legacy loyalty programs really worked back when there was something of value there? Think about that in your company. Make people feel like they're a part of your organization. The same way the corner merchant did when you came in the store and you felt valued. And guys, if you're in retail and you're ignoring these two platforms and you're not jumping in right now, today, the minute you get back to your office, you are missing the boat. These are the two best inventions for retail that were ever invented in social. Snapchat. How many, here, how many people here are on Snapchat? Awesome. How many people are actually using it? How many people are using it within their company? Right. A little fear there, right? Okay. Go look at what Grubhub did. Go look at what Groupon's doing. Go look at others. The beauty of Snapchat it is pure social. You can't fool yourselves the way you can with Twitter, with Facebook, with Instagram, and think that broadcasting is working, which it might be, but you're not really getting the most power out of it. If you're on Snapchat and you're not engaging, communicating, or sharing, you might as well not be there. The storytelling possibilities are incredible. And it's being used all the time. And by the way, if you guys want to sell millennials, that's where they're at. And Generation Z, that's where they're at right now. And don't worry about the content disappearing because it's not what you guys think it was or what you thought it was. It's now, most content is 24 hours that it lives. It can all be downloaded and used somewhere else. See what I'm doing with it. I just finally figured it out. I'm using it every day and I'm creating content on, on Snapchat that I'm using on Facebook, on Instagram, on Vine. Because it's really cool content. It's 10 second clips. And it's storytelling. And Periscope, for God's sake. Everybody here know what Periscope is? It's live streaming video, again, that you can download and reuse later. It's the experience. And by the way, if you're not using these things, all your customers are. They're all using these things. They're using them in your stores. If you're not involved, if you're not doing them, then you're not innovating. And I see some really remarkable things going on, but you guys got to jump into these platforms. And at the end of the day, most of these platforms were built for fun. You've got to start having some fun. You've got to start bringing back innovation into your companies. You've got to start allowing people to start thinking like children again. We knock the creativity out of all of our kids, and then we knock it out of all our employees. When was the last time you were in a brainstorming meeting where brains were actually storming? No, there's two guys speaking. Everybody else is afraid. 
They're going to say something stupid. Their boss is going to get annoyed. Something's going to happen. You've got to start allowing people to think. Have you guys tried this? Anybody here working in an office with a lot of people? Anybody? Go to your office tomorrow. Sit down at your desk and just sit there like this and stare straight ahead. No screen in front of you, nothing. See how long it takes for somebody to come over and ask you if you're okay. And when they come over and they ask you, are you okay, say, yeah, I'm fine. And they're going to say, what are you doing? And you're going to say, I'm thinking. They're going to say, you're what? We're all executing. Nobody's thinking anymore. You guys ever go into a children's museum where they have a table of blocks, where the kids pay with blocks? Again, as divorced dad, this was my home. Whenever it rained, I didn't have anything to do with my kids, I went to the children's museum. And I would watch the kids at the blocks table play. And it's remarkable, because they don't criticize each other. They're not afraid of coming up with ideas. They try again and again to build a bridge without any support, and the block just falls, and nobody says you're a freaking idiot. They say, let's try it again. That's what we have to instill back in our companies. Anybody here ever tried to dig to China when they were a kid? I did it every time I was at the beach. Okay? Today, go to the beach and watch this happen. And the parent's going, son, do you know that it's 2,342 miles to China? You're never going to get there. Let the kid try. I expected a Chinese head to pop up every time I was there. And I kept trying. And my parents let me try. And it wasn't because they were just glad to get rid of me. It's because they knew that I was using my imagination, that I was using my mind. If they did have a discussion with me, it was more about what am I going to do with the Chinese people when I find them. Relationships are like muscle tissue. The more you engage them, the stronger and more valuable they become. And I want to leave you guys with one last thing. So here I was, divorced dad. My daughters were five and seven years old. And I got stuck with what I call the divorced dad car. It's the little two-seat convertible. And I got two little girls in the back who are way too close to each other. So all I'm hearing all day long, whenever we drive anywhere, is dad, she's touching me, she's pinching me. She's staring at me. Now my personal favorite, she's smelling me, daddy. <laughs> Where do you go with that? And my little one sit there going, making as much of a noise as she could just to annoy my older daughter. I was beside myself. How do I fix this? So I started thinking to the playground next to my apartment where I used to take the girls every day. And I realized that whenever I was in the playground and they started fighting, I would take them by the hands and I would skip. And everything would get good in the world because nobody can be upset when they're skipping. It just makes you happy. So here's my last piece of advice. If you're having a bad day, get up in your office and take a skip. I do it every day. I guarantee you, if it doesn't make you feel better, it will make everybody around you feel better. <laughs> but more importantly, if your consumers can metaphorically skip with every interaction with your brand, you win. Thank you very much. Story Snapchat here. So I am going to close out with just one thing. I want you guys to wave. I'll tell you when, because I want to add it to my story. So, um, okay, everybody, we're at Retail Innovation Conference. Everybody wave. Thanks, guys. Thank that was an awesome presentation, right? Yeah. Hey! Thank you.